Paul's going to start. He doesn't need an introduction because we know who he is <laughs> and what he does. But I will tell you, we have a speaker's class on Sunday mornings. It's, the speaker starts at 10 and goes to 1045, so you have time to get to the second service. And this week, we've got Pat Lewis talking on women's suffrage. And it, she did this past Sunday, and he, she reminded she's a female version of Paul. Oh, and awesome. she's really interesting. So she has one more this Sunday. So y'all come in here. She's really good. And she's wanted to make sure the men knew that they were invited, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Some really nice tidbits. But she reminded me a lot of, of Paul and her knowledge and sharing. So, Paul, turn it over Thank to you. you. Uh, Chairman, thank you for all you've done. Oh, you're uh, welcome. Appreciate you being here. We've got a small group tonight. There's so many conflicts and people call me and they've got bronchitis and you name it. It's just crazy how much stuff is going around. Tonight we're going to talk about uh, homemade religions and movements in America, <laughs> of which there are so many that I can't begin to uh, do them. But I want to start with the English Civil War, 1642-49. There's hardly been an event in English or American history that has had a bigger impact than the English Civil War. Hi, Jimmy. Hi, Janet. And uh, this, in a lot of ways, is the root cause for many of these social movements that are just so, so extreme, so unusual. The English Civil War, of course, was the Calvinists who represent the idea of, of what we call today uh, the Republican idea that individual, the, the people should be represented. And so they, the Puritans were big backers of Parliament, and the Church of England uh, backed the royalty, and they were big supporters of the establishment, which was the king, and then line authority from the king. Everyone is, derives their power and authority given to them by the king, by divine right, because the king is, after all, the appointed by God. And so what, what happened in the English Civil War, just in the thumbnail, is that the, the Puritans were fighting for the cause of parliament. They're fighting for the cause of the people. And uh, the royalty were fighting for the cause to keep the establishment the way it is, had been for all these years, and no change, status quo. And this was a terrible war. The uh, Puritans were called roundheads because they would shave their heads and in defiance of the, the royals who all had long hair. And it was this. The, 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 they called themselves the New Model Army because they were dedicated to God. It's, it, in a lot of ways, it's like a jihad, right? The idea that it is your moral duty to, uh, <coughs> to, to, to defend your point of view by killing other people, which, of course, is the fundamental of any, any war, any battle. And so, out of this English Civil War comes an extraordinary conclusion, and that is the Puritans won, even though they were going up against the establishment. It's a, it's a great tribute to the uh, organizational ability of the Puritans. And because they won, they then basically, as soon as they cut off the head of the king, and gotten rid, they assumed, of the royalty, one of the very first thing they do is establish freedom of religion. Now this freedom of religion extended to everyone except Roman Catholics. They hated Roman Catholics, the Puritans did. Uh, they didn't like the Church of England, but they were willing to coexist with the Church of England. And this is the point where we, we start to see the outcome of all of this, and that is the creation of what's called the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth was the invention of the Puritans that, that, that all English people should share in both the prosperity and the problems 
of the country of England. It shouldn't be, the, the, the power shouldn't flow from the top down. The people should be involved and decide. Common wealth, everything in common. Now this is one of the very first inklings of what will become a major theme now uh, in the 17th century and into the 18th century, and that is egalitarianism. Now, egalitarianism is at the root of almost all of these movements that we're going to talk about tonight. So, the Commonwealth then has as, at its head a man named Oliver Cromwell. And uh, Cromwell was, unfortunately, Cromwell became a dictator. Now, this, this is hard to explain this, how this works, but they had no model except the ancient Greeks for a real republic and how, how they would transition power from one group to another. And so Cromwell ends up being a pretty bad guy. Among the many bad things he did, he invaded Ireland and of course starts the next 200 years of war in Ireland. But Cromwell was, was a man of ideological purity. In other words, he believed that, that Parliament should rule, but then when Parliament did agree with, didn't agree with him, thank you, when Parliament didn't agree with him, he just tells Parliament not to meet, and then he rules by <coughs> dictate, right? This is crazy. Now, his, uh, his second in command was a man named John Milton. Now, John Milton, of course, was um, a person who could write and speak Latin, so he was called Latin Secretary, which we would say Secretary of State. And John Milton was the ideological, moral, and ethical leader of the Puritans. And uh, later, when the, when the Commonwealth is over, and John Milton is in old age and blind, he, he hires a scribe and he dict dictates to the scribe the magnificent work known as Paradise Lost, hmm. which is the second Bible to all Puritans. If Puritan owned two books, one would be the Bible, the other would be the Paradise Lost. And if you want to understand sort of the worldview of the Puritans and their idea of evil and God and all of it, it's all there somewhere in, in the um, Paradise Law. I have my students read book one. There's about 30 books. But we, we read book one, and it's so thick with, with learning and knowledge. And it's just compendious encyclopedia of, of knowledge about the ancient world. And uh, so John Milton is really important to understanding how these people thought, what was important to them. Well, anyway, during then, this commonwealth, because of the freedom the Puritans brought in religion, it's, it's like dandelions in the spring. They just started popping up these religions. <laughs> and one of the most famous of these, of course, were the Society of Friends, we always know as the Quakers. So called because of their experience of being pretty wild in their uh, religious services, where they, they, would, they would get into these quaking uh, bits when they were having some kind of metaphysical experience. I want to talk to you a little bit about the Quakers because. Out of the Quakers, so much comes, all right? So the Quaker is the leader of the Quaker, who, who is, uh, and this all evolved during the, this Commonwealth period, was a man named George Fox. Now, Fox was always in trouble with somebody. Fox was one of these outspoken people who did not, uh, did not brook compromise in any way. He is a Puritan who then wants to, wants to totally separate himself from anything that smacks at traditional religion. 
And uh, so he gets in a lot of trouble. In 1862, um, uh, uh, just at the end of the uh, Commonwealth, they pass, uh, the king comes back in and they pass uh, the Quaker Act, <coughs> which is that um, you can have no religious meaning outside the established religion. And this is, but this is really targeted at the Quakers because what the Quakers did, they would come together in a meeting. Has anybody here been to a Quaker meeting? Mm -hmm. All right. I've, I've visited a few times. It's a really kind of amazing when you come into a Quaker meeting because it's very much about what people, how the spirit moves the people, right? So they'll sit very quietly and maybe nothing will happen for 15 minutes, but they're not, they're meditating, they're not really visiting or anything like that. And then they start Somebody will get up and start to talk. And then somebody will start to sing. And then somebody will uh, get very intense, very emotional. And some of these meetings would just go on for hours. But again, no plan, no order, see? Now what do you say, why? Egalitarianism, see? Everybody does what each per person wants to do. Does that make sense? It's hard, you know, it's hard to reinterpret all this. But this idea that the, every individual has the inner light of Christ and that you have this God-like quality within you and everybody should be allowed to express themselves in a unique and special way, all right? Now, th this, much of this, of this idea of, of the inner self, uh, Jimmy, you can relate to in Christian science, you know, the importance of how God dwells within us and all of this kind of thing. Well, anyway, um, it's a creedless religion. There's no dogma. Even, even the Church of Christ says, you know, our dogma is the Bible. Quaker, they don't say that. In other words, there is no dogma. There's nothing you can hang on to and it's pretty much a, a lay-run religion. But what made it unique, more than anything else, from the beginning, now we're talking 1600s here, ladies and gentlemen, they had women preachers. Hmm. Women could raise, get raised up to the highest position in the church. And that's the transition I want to get to now, to talk about the first of these many really strange and radical religions uh, that are kind of born out of, out of the out, out, outcome of the English Civil War, and that is Anne <coughs> Lee. Now, Anne Lee is an English lady who was born into great poverty. She was from the very lowest class of society. She belonged to the Church of England in the way everybody did. You know, you were just born into the Church of England, and um, she um, was often accused of crimes um, because she was extremely outspoken. She's a Quaker preacher, see? And, and this, this kind of letting herself, letting, allowing herself to express herself just got her into trouble very often because women aren't supposed to speak up especially not in church, right? By the way, it's the society of friends, not church of friends. Understand that difference? Okay. So anyway, um, she is going along in her misery, you might say, when the famous George Whitfield is preaching. Now George Whitfield, in case you didn't know this, was a Methodist preacher but of a very Calvinistic strain. And uh, he was a brain preacher and he got people really excited and Ann Lee is one of the people that got excited about what he was preaching. So she attends a meeting and, uh, and then uh, her, here's about the Quakers. Now the Quakers in those days weren't just a unified group in any way, shape or form. There are little Quaker groups here and there. 
the group she joined were called the Wardleyites because their leader was named Ward. Uh, and the Wardleyites were, were very much into what we call very, I'd say, ecstatic worship, where they, they're jumping around, they're getting very emotional. But the kind of idea I get in mind is a Pentecostal meeting of the old style, where people are, you know, just really get out of control. We call them holy rollers. And uh, here's, a, here's another, th another thing that was unique about the Wardleyites. They believed in open confession. You know what open confession is? You know, Roman Catholicism, you go uh, to the priest in, in, a, in a booth, and you very quietly tell him or, uh, the sins you've committed. Well, in the, in the Quaker group, they would talk to each other about their sins. In other words, it was what we call it a sensitivity session. You know, you, you, just, you just pour it all out. Everything is out there. In other words, again, egalitarianism of even a thought. In other words, you share with everybody your thoughts. Well, this, this it is um, one, of, one of the things that uh, then Ann Lee does is she really catches the spirit of this and starts preaching. And, uh, but she has visions and voices and things come to her. And so she feels like she's speaking the words that God had given her. And so she, she's very controversial. And uh, one of the things one of the things that she starts preaching is the idea that the second coming of Christ will be as a woman. This is critical. Because, in fact, when she finally starts to form her group, which is, by the way, very, very small, she calls it the United Society in the Second Coming of Christ. The United Society in the Second Coming of Christ. And this, of course, is the organization, only maybe five or ten people, that she then brings to the United States. So, and, um, and one other detail needs to be thrown in here. Uh, along about this time that she's starting to become not just a preacher, but also the founder of her own Quaker group, if you will, uh, she, her father insists that she get married and forces her to marry, name, a man, marry a man named Abraham Stanley. Now, Stanley uh, was a, um, a illiterate person just like Ann Lee was. Uh, neither one could sign their names. And uh, they, were, they were married and uh, she had four children. Now, one of the things that caused a lot of her radical thinking was the fact that she was forced to marry this man. She has four children, and all four children die. Yeah. And so she sees this as a sign of God, that she is not to have sex and not to be with Abraham. Uh, strangely enough, he follows her to the new world when she comes, and uh, she... Um, as she creates the United Society of Christ's Second Coming, she, he is, of course, one of the early charter members of that church, even though what she's preaching is this radical separation of the sexes, right? In the name of, are you ready? Egalitarianism. This idea that women and men should be equal. So, because she's terribly persecuted in England, she and her very, very small little group come to America, 1874. One of the first things that happens to her is, is the beginning, 1874, of course, is the beginning of the American Revolution. And they... they 1774. Oh, excuse me. Thank you. 1774 is the beginning of the American Revolution. And she is, she is assumed to be a British spy, so she gets thrown in jail here. She had been thrown in jail in England and uh, kept getting in and out. But anyway, she starts preaching here and there, and people start following her. A very famous Baptist minister um, was named Joseph Meacham. He, he become 
probably her first really important convert because then he led his congregation into her group. Uh, and so, again, these radical ideas, rejection of all ritual, the refusal uh, to bear arms, the uh, com everything is communalized, that is to say everything is, everybody is equal in the organization, and uh, most important is e female equality. So she starts having these meetings with her group, and uh, they, she is um, back and forth out of trouble all the time. <laughs> she uh, decides to go on a missionary journey in 1781 around the colonial United States. She picks up any um, new converts and comes and start and, and uh, the thing starts to coalesce. Uh, and uh, at age 48, given all of her travels and how what weak conditioning she was in, she dies. So she lives a very short life, but, but what an impact. And so following her, you have a number of people taking up her cause, and, uh, and this, of course, they come to believe that Anne Lee is, was in fact, or is in fact, the Christ that is come back in the second coming. So in other words, the second coming has happened, and Anne Lee was the second coming. And uh, this you know, seems outrageous in a way, but from their point of view, they saw her as a great saint, a great teacher, a great leader, and so they were going to carry on her work. So they start to form into these communities, and uh, eventually there were around 22 major Shaker communities in the United States. Now, one of the very first principles, of course, is separation of the sex. So men and women live together, but have no contact, except once a week when they would have a special meeting and the women, they would, they would take these pews and line them up facing each other and the men would sit down and the women would sit down and whoever you were sitting across, you'd carry on a conversation with. And that was your socializing. But what really is strange about the Shakers is their form of worship, uh, which were called jubilations. And these jubilation, the heart of the jubilation were these dances. Very unusual liturgical dancing. If you go to um, Canterbury, Bill, Canterbury Village in New Hampshire, and trying to get Jimmy and Janet to go there for years, on the floor there are all these little marks everywhere. And these marks are positions in these dances that they would do. And some of them are very fast dances, some of them are slow, but they all have these uh, story. They all have storylines in, in them. And so this became the centerpiece of the whole religious experience, the dancing, right? Because remember, the actual Shaker service was, uh, and, and they came to, by the way, the word Shaker is pejorative. They were called originally quaking, um, sh sh shaking Quakers, which got collapsed into Shakers. But they were not, they didn't call themselves Shakers, they were the United Society in Christ's Second Coming. Now, what's, what's fascinating is, this group lasts almost 200 years, and yet they have no children. So how is this possible? The answer is adoption. There were vast numbers of homeless children all over America in those days, and the Quakers, um, the Quakers, the Shakers took them in in large numbers. And each generation, those children would grow up. Most of them would, would leave, but a few would stay in the community, and then they'd adopt more kids. And they were still going. So I was at, in 1970s, I was at Canterbury Shaker Village in New Hampshire. And uh, I was just in the right place at the right time. And somebody said to me, do you see that lady sitting over there? 
Yeah? That's the last living shaker. So I saw the last living shaker in my lifetime. Oh. And, and uh, uh, the man who pointed it out, it was a guy there, his name was Daryl Thompson. He, he had, his parents had worked for the shakers and he had grown up with the shakers. So when Ken Bird spent the PBS series that included the shakers, um, that it, he, uh, this Daryl Thompson was the, uh, the, shall we say, the consultant, the expert. Well, anyway, um, th this, this, the, th the thing that comes across to us is how the sh shakers were obsessed with cleanliness. Now, this is this theme throughout all religious movements, but most especially and particularly with these fanatical groups. They were so obsessed with cleanliness. Uh, there's a, a Japanese sect called Risho Kosukai. And every day they, in, in the temple, they all get down and they, for about, uh, about half an hour, they just scrub, scrub, scrub the floor. The floor was scrubbed yesterday, it'll be scrubbed tomorrow, but they scrub it every single day because they want it to be absolutely pure. And this connection between purity and holiness is an old one. And uh, you, know, goes, you see this with the Jews in the temple. There could not be any, anything dead, a dead insect, a dead bird, anything in the temple, because that would be contamination. So you had to have holiness. They also believed that neatness, Everything had to be in its place. So in, if you're in the Shaker community, everything has an exact place. And they had, they had all these strange ideas, I mean, strange in the sense compared to the conventional society. For example, if you go into an interior room, like a closet, there'll be a window. So finally, I, you know, I saw these, like, you have the outdoor, and then see this, row, if you're in a Shaker building, this, they would have windows in this interior wall. So I finally asked, I said, why? Why do you have windows on the interior wall? And he said, it's called borrowed light. So they borrow the light from this room to go into that room. And uh, this really makes a lot of sense. I mean, typical shaker efficiency, right? They, they're also obsessed with work. So they work, work, work hard because they consider work as worship, as service. Doing, doing things. Uh, always with the idea that doing things to perfection. So they were perfectionists with a small p. And uh, uh, again, everything in common. Well anyway, uh, so the Shakers in America and their various communities, there's a whole long list of firsts. They were the first, along with the Quakers, to promote female equality. They were, where they were among the very first pacifistic groups in America. They were among the very first groups to fight against slavery. And uh, they were always uh, socialistic slash communistic in their ways. Everything was done for the group. And uh, hardly anything was done uh, for an individual. Now, you might think that these people would be against technology in much the same way that the uh, Amish are against technology, right? So the, the Amish are still farming the way they farmed 500 years ago, and they're still using horses and so forth. But the Amish, not so. The Amish are very interested in technology. So they're endlessly inventing. Now... You mean the Shakers? I mean the Shakers. The Shakers are endlessly inventing uh, uh, because, unlike the Amish, they believe that, that if they can find a labor-saving device, that they can then uh, make things more quickly and, again, always trying to achieve perfection, right? If, if a machine helps them in their goal of making things cleaner, and neater, they're all for it, right? So anyway, I want you to listen to this list of inventions of the Shakers. 
The first uh, was a dream one of the sisters had for a circular saw, mm -hmm. right? Circular saws. See, saws were just the old kind. <laughs> and uh, she had this idea of a circular saw. And of course, that's had revolutionary impact. The flat broom. The brooms at that time, when the Shakers came along, were round. They looked like witches' brooms. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they invented the flat brooms. And the why? So you could get into the corner and clean out the corner. <laughs> that, that was their, their obsession. Clothes pins, shaker invention. But here's the big one, the screw propeller. Now, it was a shaker man on the Hudson River. I've seen these boats going down. They had paddle wheels, right? And steam engines had paddle wheels. And uh, he, thought, he wondered about this. And he, he had read about Archimedes' screw, where they would raise water from the Nile, the Greeks would, uh, by turning it, and then the water would come up the tube. And it, in other words, it made water move. And he, he, he reasoned, if we could attach the uh, steam engine to a propeller and, and get, the, get the blade just the right angle, it would move water. That's, that was the idea, and so he invented it. And many of the shakers did not believe in patenting anything, so that man never got credit. You know who the man that got credit for it? Who invented, supposedly invented the steamboat? Fulton. Huh? Fulton. Fulton, that is correct. Fulton. Okay. Fulton. Yeah, and uh, so he gets credit, you know, if you read in the books, but it's really a, sh a, sh a shaker man that comes up with the idea. And what's really interesting is that then when the Wright brothers come along, they use the concept of propeller. If you can move water, you can move air. So they, they monkey with various shapes for the propeller and get it just the right angle so it moves the right amount of air. And voila, the first airplane. Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. They also invented, believe it or not, the rocking chair. You know, rocking chairs, people think they've always been rocking chairs. No, it was the first rocking chair was in a, on a shaker port somewhere. Uh, the double chambered stove, the uh, water repellent cloth, um, oval nesting boxes, you can, you can still buy those today. And probably one of the most utilitarian thing they invented was the seed packet. You go down to buy your flowers or vegetable seeds and a little paper packet that was invented by the Shakers. And they used to sell lots and lots of seeds to people. Well, anyway, here, here's, the, here's, here's the, the roundup on the, on the Shakers. The Shakers were radical by any definition, definition of the word. They lived a very, almost monastic life. But fused to this monastic life was these, all this dancing. And at the same time, they were very big into like music, musicals. They would, they, they had, uh, if you go to Canterbury, you see they had a beautiful pipe organ. They loved music. They, they enjoyed themselves, but they had a lot of time on their hands. They had a lot of time on their hands because no children. And they had a kind of a setup that uh, certain jobs would be done. I thought this wasn't very egalitarian, but the, the women still did the washing. Now, it was the man that invented the wash machine. So they had wash machines. You'll see them there. Amazing. But they, they, they had their wash machines but the women still primarily do those kind of domestic in, interior sort of things. They didn't see that as a contradiction somehow. But the, the Shakers are endlessly fascinating. And uh, what, what, you, what, I, what you see in America is the Shakers, although Anne Lee was from England, the, the group evolves. The whole organization thing evolves in America. It's a very much an American experiment. And it's this period after the American Revolution 
until the Civil War, you see all of these amazing experiences uh, with communalism, one kind or another, not the least of which is Dallas, Texas, was of course founded by that very radical communistic group known as the Fourier Society. Maybe we'll have time to talk about that a little bit later, but I want to talk instead uh, right now about the next most radical group in the United States that had believed many of the same things the Shakers did, but also were completely on the opposite side of the equation in terms of relationship between men and women. This, of course, is the famous Oneida colony. Now, Oneida is, of course, from is Oneida, New York. That's why it's called that. Founded by a Puritan. In fact, he went to Yale Divinity School after he attended Dartmouth. His name was John Humphrey Noyce. Now, I want to dare you to find somebody more radical than this man in every possible sense of the word. So let's talk about his, his life a little bit. He was, he was born 1811, died in the 1880s, so he lived a pretty long life. He, uh, he had this idea as he went to Yale Divinity School, as he read the scriptures, it occurred to him that it was possible for people to live in perfection. So he called his movement perfectionism. <laughs> perfectionism. And the, the followers were called perfectionists. They were trying to live the perfect life. Now, th this is you know, a very dubious, I would say, idea that anybody could live the perfect life, but he, he, was, he wanted to try it. Now, his radical egalitarianism was economic unity, or economic equality between all people, and social equality between all people. Now, the Shakers wouldn't have disagreed with that but it's his idea of social equality. So instead of not having any marriage, not having any sex, he goes the other end of the spectrum. Everybody has sex with everybody all the time, right? <laughs> he called it complex marriage. <coughs> yes, it'd be complex, all right. Or complicated. Yeah, or complicated. <laughs> What happened is, uh, the, his, his group was about 300 that, that coalesced around him in Oneida. And there's a, there's a building there, it's still there, you can go visit it, called the Mansion House. Now the Mansion House is a building, uh, huge. it's like a home, but it's, it looks like an old main or something. And this is a massive thing, right? And that's where they all live together. Now, here's how complex marriage worked. There were almost there were a few rules. That you, you know, I guess even in paradise, you have to have few rules, right? Mm -hmm. And one rule was that you could sleep with anybody you wanted to. <laughs> you just couldn't sleep with anybody you wanted to. In in repetition, right? So you could, you could sleep here and here and here and here, but then you would, but if you start sleeping the same person, then mm -mm, they put an end to that. See, because you had to be married to everybody in the community. Get it? Now, that would be complicated enough. They had a kind of elaborate system in which uh, the there was a kind of a system of communication. So somebody would send a note to somebody and say, I'd like to be with you. Um, what are you doing Friday night? You know, that kind of thing. And uh, so they would, they would get together 
And, uh, but then they came, they would have these, um, you know, everybody was doing that. But then once a week, they got together and they would have these sessions uh, that, in which everybody told everything that was going on in their lives. They'd say, you know, Monday night I slept with so and so, and Tuesday night I slept with so and so, and all that. And so there was no secrets. See, everything had to be open. This is the idea of egalitarianism, is that every, everything, it's totally, what do we say nowadays? Uh, transparent. transparent, thank you, thank you. Yeah, and, and the irony, of course, is hardly anything's transparent, right? And, uh, but there's transparency of relationships, right? Can you imagine this? Well, as time went on, they evolved a, a doctrine which we call today eugenics. Which means, in Greek, of course, EU means good, and genics, genes, good genes. So the group decided that the thing to do was to put people together who would produce a certain kind of offspring. For example, they would say, now, so-and-so is really good in music, and we know, notice that uh, Brother Fred over here very talented music. Let's have them have a child, and they'll have a child, and that child will be good in music. That, that means it's called Planned Parent. Yeah, it's called Planned Parent. <laughs> and it, it, it's eugenics in its most primitive and basic form. And uh, so this, this, this eugenics idea uh, ended up with many, many children. Now, you've got to remember something important here. There are no family units. So the children are raised by the community, right? They're, they're well taken care of, but they don't necessarily know even who their parents are. Although, in, as they got older, they wanted to know. And so they, you know, again, transparency, they tell them who their parents were. And when the Oneida colony was finally over, they, the children, the thing they complained about was not living with their parents. They, because they were living, all the kids lived together and they were taken care of by certain people, but it wasn't their own parents. So they didn't, they were treated well, but they weren't treated special in the way a parent would treat a child, right? And so that, that became a source of conflict. Now, uh, John Humphrey Noyce got into this, he fathered it said nine children in the eugenics program that they had going on. And uh, they, uh, they, except for the children being unhappy uh, when they got older, most of the members were very content with the system. And when it finally came to an end, they had to decide to whom they wanted to be married because there was no longer going to be a community. And that was just hell for them, because they liked the idea, many of them, of being, you know, of having all these different relationships and being part of a community. It, it's kind of the same thing with the polygamous Mormons. The women don't like it at first, but then as time goes on, they get very close to each of the wives, gets close to the other wife, and they, they become sisters. And then they raise their children together and they share their pain together, and they have all this stuff together. And so, later on, you know, they just soon the husband go away, because they'll just stay and keep, you know, keep doing what they do as a community. That's a kind, Mormonism, by the way, of the original variety, was very egalitarian in, in, the, in certain ways. And it was a very anti-egalitarian in other ways. But one, but one way in which it was egalitarian is it's called the uh, uh, Society of Enoch. And the Society of Enoch, everything is in common. And they still carry on that to a certain extent. You know, if you're a Mormon and you lose your job, the bishop gives you a card and you can go down here in Carrollton to their supermarket and uh, go around with your cart and pick up everything you need, and there's no checkout, you just show your card. 
and you keep you can do that as long as you don't have a job. In other words, it's a social safety network system that they have for members of that community. Now, what do you suppose happened with this group? They were constantly being sued by somebody, practicing bigamy, practicing noise was in hot water many, many times about bigamy. And so finally, they just couldn't, you know, they had in too many lawsuits, the thing, the thing unraveled. It took about 30 years. And uh, when noise died, then the whole thing fell, fell apart. But about this time, they're trying to find a way to continue to make money. So they get into the, the trap, the building traps, you know, trapping bears, trapping beavers, that kind of thing. And they made some money doing that, but they, somebody suggested they make silverware. And so they started making silverware, and uh, well, not silverware. So that ended up being a corporation, joint stock company, where, which is uh, still in existence today. Much in the same way the Amana colony, when it disintegrated up there in Iowa, became a joint stock company, and they then went on to build the Amana refrigerators and the Amana, micro, Amana uh, microwave uh, and, and so forth. Now, uh, our time just goes away. Uh, let, what, here's, here's the thing. That's important. What was the time frame of this? Uh, yeah, so the Oneida, so uh, uh, this is the 18, 18, it gets cranked up about the 1840s and then uh, goes until the late 1880s in, in some form. But the, but the Oneida, they weren't in Oneida the whole time, they were in Canada and other places, but they were in uh, Oneida, New York for about 30 years. And if you want to go and see an interesting place, if you're ever up in that part of the world, go see Oneida, uh, the mansion house, see how these people live. One of the things that would interest you, Janet, is that it was a, a lady, uh, one of the Shaker ladies, who had the idea of women wearing pants. And so they, she invented these pants that they wear under their dresses. And of course, eventually they got to, they were they became popular in American culture generally, and they were called bloomers. And those are the very first pants that uh, women wore regularly in the United States in that uh, end of the century period of time. Uh, what's really here? This is remarkable to me. When, when I came to Dallas in 1970, he went to work the first day. And uh, you know, all new teachers. Everybody's young and enthusiastic and excited about being college teachers. And uh, so the president gets up, and this is how he begins. Well, he starts with a prayer, because he was uh, also a Baptist lay preacher. But he said, uh, "It's wonderful to see these beautiful pants suits that many of you women are wearing. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to they look good on you." Glad to see you in, but of course, come next Monday we start school, no pantsuits. That's 1970. See, bloomers, you know, back at the turn of the century. So, of course, that didn't last long. And, and now, let's see. Yeah, not too many, not too many uh, skirts or dresses here. Now, and that's the way it should be, of course. But. But what's interesting is the cultural change you know, that's come to our culture. Now, uh, here, here's the thing I want to get across. There are, there are just dozens of these groups, but many of them have these same themes, this idea they're going to live the holy life. So many of them come from Germany. And uh, the, of course, the earliest of these were the Amish, but then eventually the Mennonites and the Hutterites and the Brethren and all these other groups that came. And they, this idea of living everything in common, 
And uh, they're, they're so egalitarian that if you go, for example, to the Amana colonies in Iowa, you know, again, one of these German perfectionist groups, the, the graveyard, they have a graveyard, but they have no gravestones <laughs> because everybody's buried, everybody's the same in death, right? And, 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 and so it goes. I, I don't have time to crank up another whole group, but I, I want to I wanna leave some final thoughts here for, for you to think about. This could have only happened in one place, in my opinion, in America, and that is in America. Because America had the freedom, had no tradition of, of one religion being dominant. We did, individual colonies, of course, had one religion that were dominant. But most of these groups came out of some branch of Calvinism, some branch of uh, uh, basically out of the English Civil War, and they are all derivative in one way or another, be either the Quakers, the Puritans, all of these uh, sundry <coughs> Calvinist groups. It is, I think, um, a, a great testimony to America that this happened here. And to think that it's only in America that women have started religion. I have studied this, by the way, high and low. Somebody one year said to me, well, there's a lady in, in Japan that started religion. So I researched this, of course. And it turns out, she, she did, she was there. She's got these a group of people going, but she didn't have any organization ability. And a man comes in and, and takes it over and uh, organizes the whole thing. And, uh, but they give great honor to her, just in the same way the Seventh-day Adventists give great honor to Ellen White. But Ellen White was a, uh, uh, a, a, a woman. Ellen White was a woman who um, was willing to defer to men. So uh, the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist movement are uh, all um, all men, except for this one woman. And so, but Ellen White is the true founder. The, the fact that she's given the honor and they read her books to this day is an amazing thing. Anne Lee was born in England, but she spent her, her career is primarily here in America, and she defines her religion here in America. And, uh, and of course, the famous Amy Semple McPherson, who is not just one of the great female evangelists of all time, but she's the first Pentecostal, really famous, first really famous Pentecostal leader that America had. And uh, it is, I think, very, very um, important to, to acknowledge this, because people don't talk about this very much, the importance of women in American, in American culture. Uh, on the religious perspective. By the way, we're in the Myrtle Fillmore room. <laughs> Myrtle Fillmore, of course, yes. is, and many people believe, is the true founder of unity. Uh, her husband might disagree a little bit, but, <laughs> but she, she was a great inspirational leader and speaker. And uh, what's your take on that, Jimmy? Would you say Mildred was, was the shining light, or was it more of a team deal? It was, uh, to me, there's a, there's a lot of teamwork in it. Yeah. She, as is usually the case, women are ahead of men. She was the one who first got the whole idea, drug him along, and then he caught on. And mm -hmm. So we, we, know that it, we know that women lead the way, yeah. and men rob and take the credit. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's wonderfully egalitarian. To say it that way, but but it's true. They call them co-founders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. co-founders. Yeah. yeah, well, so, each contributed their yeah. part to it, and uh, so it's hard to say. But uh, it was based on her healing, though. Remember, mm -hmm. she went to a lecture. Yeah. With uh, was Mary it Mary Beckett? No, with Weeks and her Weeks. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what sparked everything about that she could have this healing and it reversed it. Yeah. And that so that is the foundation. That's the foundation. Community. Well, and, and uh, of course, Mary Baker Eddy really did do it all herself. Uh, she had some great helpers along the way, but she's the inspiration, she's the organizer, 
she is the, the one determined to make it happen. And uh, Unity wouldn't be here today without Mary Baker Eddy. I'm, I'm convinced. Nor any of the metaphysical groups. Or any of the metaphysical right. groups, of which there are many now. Uh, I wanted to read you uh, one last thing, and then we'll let you go. Um, in January, uh, I'm doing a program that, I've, that I'm working on now. I'm always I was telling Catherine a little while ago that I'm always six months ahead of where, where I am. I, I, actually, this program I put together quite a long time ago. And so I'm working on the January series. And Carolyn, I'll give this to you so you can give it to the people. Anyway, the title of the January series is Divine Mania, Sybils, Sibylles, and Cassandras. This has to do with the women who have had a prophetic role in ancient religion. And uh, the first week I'll talk about the oldest of the oracles. The oracles are these places people would go to hear these women, primarily, in fact, almost exclusively women who, who would speak to the future. What Jimmy said a minute ago is so true. The women are way ahead. And this is true you know, in, in uh, prophetic terms also. Then on January 13th, we'll do the Greek oracles, and then January 20th, the Roman oracles, and then the 27 Jewish and Christian oracles. You know, we don't often think about Christian oracles, but there really have been a number of of Christian prophets and prophetic sites where people would go to find out the future or to find or to, to have a reading on what's coming up in their lives. And this is the cliffhanger for that. One of the most famous of all Christian prophets was not a Christian and was not even didn't, didn't came before the Christian era, but so important was this prophet that Michelangelo put her on the Sistine Chapel, so along he's... along with the other sibyls. Here's a word that that is so important in that particular discussion. So, yeah. Sibyl. Yeah. Well, Sophia. Uh, it, it is the, the Rome only had one. And uh, no, a lesser person than St. Augustine uh, believed that this symbol, this Roman symbol, was in fact the one who correctly predicted the birth of Christ and, and the end of the Roman Empire. And that's, of course, exactly what happened. And, um, and then uh, this was such, such power that... Um, Although there, although there are a number of other symbols that Michelangelo painted on the Sistine Chapel, she is the most prominent. And, well, you know, it never occurred to me, and I'll get to you, it never occurred to me to think about what, the, what are the symbols doing in the Sistine Chapel? These, these ancient prophets, Greek and Roman, what are they doing there? And the answer, of course, is they are believed to have the prophetic gifts that foretold the coming of the Messiah. And, and so this is going to be a great series. Uh, if, I'm blessed to do it, and I hope you all here six months from now, and uh, we'll look forward to that opportunity. Um, any last questions anybody want to bring up? Some of you have been taking notes. I always appreciate that. Anything you want to ask about? Yes, just, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that the English Civil War was at all a precursor to the French Revolution? Oh, totally, absolutely. They wouldn't. The French, of course, would never admit to that that something England could have any effect on them. But see, the English went through that Civil War, and then they 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 didn't know what after the Commonwealth collapsed. They didn't know what to do, so they brought back the king, the son of the one they cut the head off of. And they had a rocky time for two more kings. And then they had 1688, the Glorious Revolution. And the Glorious Revolution was the change of government. And the way they were able to do it is they brought in a new king, 
but the new king was a Calvinist. And the, of course the Puritans loved that. And that of course is the famous William of Orange. And he married this, was married to an English royalty named Mary. So William and Mary. So the second oldest college in America is William and Mary. And uh, so th th this is uh, a very, very important detail. The English changed the culture, got a republic without bloodshed. And the French, of course, over time, they, they don't adjust. The, the, the royalty doesn't give up any power. And so the pressure just keeps building and building. And then in 1789, it explodes. And uh, France, you know, 150 years, I would say France is now strong and good, but they went through hell. Uh, that England never went through, didn't have to endure. Yeah, great Even though the Civil War in England was pretty darn bad. It was terrible, but it was, the la but it was, but it was the outcome of that Civil War, which is the Glorious Revolution. But because of that, because that Civil War, bad as it was, it's why we have democracy in this country. That's why we have a republic. It's the model of what the Puritans wanted. Yeah, uh, Tom. Well, what a, okay, two of them. <laughs> yeah. So, was there just one civil, or were there a whole no, bunch no, of civils? No, no, many civils. Oh, okay, many all right. Yeah. So then, my understanding too is that that oracle in uh, the Delphi. Greek, Delphi. Well, yeah, Delphi, was about a thousand years? Oh, more than that, yeah. Really? It went way back, but it wasn't a civil. That one of the great archaeological and, and historical problems is was the civil, there was a civil at Delphi. But is that the, is that the same thing as, as the oracle at Delphi, where a woman sat on a tripod? Most scholars think that it was. But the problem is, it's, it's, and back then it was obvious to everybody, so they don't ever say it. That nobody actually says that the, that the uh, Sybil at Delphi was the oracle hmm. of Delphi. Okay. But the, the, it, it is possible, I don't think very likely, that there were competing Sybils, but that doesn't make any sense at all. To me, it's, it's, it's obvious that that was the Sybil at Delphi, and that's the most famous uh, oracle in, in the ancient world, was at Delphi. Well, then you also said that only in America. Yeah. And I understand the perfection of part yeah. of the egalitarianism, yeah. but I really had gotten from you that in Rome there were so many acceptance of weird religions. Yeah, that, exactly. But, but that's a different type well, I, of yeah, I, yeah, I was referring to the fact that only, only in America women started religion. Uh, okay. Yeah, because the Romans were always very patriarchal. And uh, so they will have the Sibyls, and they will import these religions for women, primarily, but they aren't, they're not, they're men that are driving the, the, these organizations. And, and uh, they're not exclusively women. Uh, the Great Mother Cult came very close to it. But, they, but all the priests were men who had castrated themselves. There weren't any female priest, priestesses. And so, you, you, that is, to me, the greatest irony at all. Men have to castrate themselves to become women, but the women cannot become priestess in the cult of the Great Mother. Figure that one out. And they put on dresses. And they put on dresses and wigs and lipstick and all the rest of it. I have, uh, I'll show.